Hello, thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Kevin Hockenberry. This is my wife, Stacy Hockenberry. We are the co-pastors of Authentic Church located right here in Winter Springs, Florida. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope that you would dig into the word in the next couple of minutes and that you would enjoy. If you wanna partner with Authentic Church and what we are doing and what God is doing here in this area, please click the giving link below. Enjoy. Let's all stand as we worship this morning, as we read God's word. This morning, I want to share a scripture from Psalm 63, verses 1 through 4. Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live lifting up my hands to you in prayer. Before we uh, get started here, I just want us to welcome the Lord into this place. Begin to lift up your voice in gratitude and praise. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, come.
you, Jesus, in this place, Lord, and we are thankful, God, that you are present in this room, Lord, and we're here to encounter you today, God.
respond to him. We say we love you. to love you back, Jesus. Lord, and I pray, God, that your spirit would continue to teach us what it means to love you and what it looks like to love you, God. That we wouldn't bring you cheap phrases, Lord, that we hear in church, God. But God, we would get alone with you, Lord, and listen for your voice, God. turn, Jesus, in spirit and in truth, God. We thank you for your presence. 
And we thank you for your spirit that guides us, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Fine Arts 2K24. Let's go. That was awesome. That was a recap of what our students did a couple weeks ago when they went to National Fine Arts in Columbus, Ohio. Good news is next year and like the next five years, it will be here in Orlando. So if you want to come and support the students of our church, it's at the Orlando Convention Center. It's a really great time. It's a really fun time to see our students preaching the gospel, singing songs, um, doing puppetry things, doing art writing categories. It's amazing. So that was just a, a sneak peek of what a week with 20 of our Verity students look like. It was a great time. It's an honor to serve those students of our church. Amen. Well, if it's your first time here, welcome to Authentic Church. And for all of you guys returning, welcome home. I'm so glad you guys are here today. My name is Anthony. I'm the Worship and Creative Arts Director here at Authentic Church. And I love this place. Make some noise if you love this place. Okay, let's go. That's awesome. Well, if you did, if it is your first time when you walked in this morning, you may have been given a connect card that looks like that one on the little loop. If you didn't get one of those, that's okay. You can scan our QR code or you can text that phone number to let us know that you were here. It helps us to keep record of your visit. And more importantly, it helps us to connect with you, to pray with you, to walk with your family, whatever it is you're going through. So yeah, do that. Cool. That's yeah. Just leave that up for a minute. I have a couple of announcements. All my ladies, we have our next ladies night coming up on the 26th. I know we always say space is limited, but this one really is limited space. We only have a, a few spaces left um, for our ladies night. So if you're interested in coming and participating in that, you should sign up like today. Go to our website, myauthenticchurch.com slash events and sign up. Um, we're going to be having an away game, which usually we have our ladies nights at our headquarters, our space here in uh, Winter Springs Town Center. But this time we're going to be at the Stroke of Art Art Studio doing um, pottery and painting the, the clay pots and all that stuff. It's going to be great. There's going to be good food. I know there's going to be good food. And I know that the ladies of the church are going to enjoy themselves because I went to the last one. I happened to have the honor of doing the food there. And it was so cool. I would like to come to this one, too, if you'll have if you'll have me. I'll cook again. I'll cook again. Maybe. Okay. Moving on. All of our young adults, we have our young adults um, ministry coming up um, and just I, this Friday. It's coming Friday. Not, yeah, it's coming Friday. If your age ages 18 to 35, Vibe is the ministry for you. Did I not do that right? I don't have notes. I'm so sorry, guys. Anyways, you can go on our website, myauthenticchurch.com slash events to find the actual dates of when that's happening. But it's coming up soon. We eat good food. We have authentic conversations and we pray with one another. It's amazing. So there's that. That's all I have. So great. If our ushers could ush, which we don't ush, we should have a bucket here though. It's, we're going to continue in our worship this morning as we receive our tithes and our, and our offerings. It truly is an honor to give, to be a part of what God is doing. Amen. And I know that, um, the economy is crazy and milk is expensive and gas is crazy. All that stuff is crazy, but you want to know what's not crazy is the economy of heaven is constant and it's reliable and, and you can depend on him. And so when we give, he doesn't need our money. He, he lets us be a part of what he's doing. When we give, 
It's a way for us to trust God with everything, our time, our talent, and our treasure. It's a form of worship when we submit something that is very important to us in, in our lives, right? You need money to survive. When we offer that as a sacrifice also, not just like, hey, I'm really good with kids. I serve in kids ministry or I can play guitar. I'll be on the worship team. Do that. But, but God requires us to give our time, talent, and our treasure. Let's bow our heads as we um, continue our worship when we receive the offering. Lord, thank you so much. God, thank you that you include me in what you're doing, that you include us. God, I thank you so much that you would use um, my tithe and my offering every month, God, to further your kingdom, to preach the gospel into dark places, to have a youth ministry that's thriving and a young adults ministry that's thriving. Lord, thank you that we can give to that. God, I thank you that we have um, all the things that you've blessed us with, Lord. I pray that we would steward that well. God, this morning as we give, Lord, I pray that you would bless this offering, that you would multiply it. You would take what we give and you would multiply it 10, 100, 1,000 times for your namesake, for your glory. God, I thank you that authentic church is a church that lives with their hands open. That authentic church is a church that has an attitude of gratitude, a heart of generosity. Lord, I pray that you would continue to meet your people where they're at in the name of Jesus. We worship you. We trust you, Lord. We pray this in your name. Everybody said amen. There's a couple ways that you can give. We have a bucket that's going to be here, a bucket in the back. We have a QR code. You can scan that. You can set up monthly giving or rotational giving, however you want to do that. But it's important that you give. Amen. Good. Everyone said, amen. Let's go. Now we're going to stand. We're going to meet one another. If you always sit on this side, travel over here and say hello to somebody. And we'll be back in just a couple minutes. I'll see you guys. Hello, church. If you can make your way back to your seats and continue in worship with us.
some of us have never experienced true love. I think we think we've experienced true love when we meet our first love and our heart is like, man, this is the greatest feeling ever. I'll do anything for this, this person. But I promise you, I've been in love before, like that, that earthly love. I have been in love before. I promise you, there is nothing like the love of God. There is nothing like having your first love be the creator of the universe. Nothing like it. So we're going to hear a message. And at the end of the message today, you're going to have an opportunity, whether you are, it's the first time you're going to introduce, be introduced to God, or it is the second time. You're going to have an opportunity to experience what love looks like. Amen. So let's continue in worship. Let's in, invite God to continue to do a work in this place. Abba Father, we love you. We welcome you. Do a work in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Let's continue to have a, a heart of worship. Thank you. Good morning, church. I'm back. I'm so happy. I am so excited to be back. I missed you. And for those of you, if this is your first time, I had the actual audacity to be gone for three Sundays. Rude. But I actually was away with my family. We had um, a couple of weeks vacation. And then we went with the youth to um, Ohio to fine arts. So I was mommy on the trip the last week, but I am really glad to be back. I do want to fix something. For those of you, I turned around and some of your, some of your eyeballs were like, what? Those of you that attend Vibe, that slide was incorrect. It is not February. It's not next year. It is in two Fridays from now, okay? So next Friday, the 30th, is Vibe. Amen? We got it? Nice. Okay, so on um, our trip... I found myself, if you know me, I found myself in several bookstores and coffee shops, but I also found myself in plant shops. Any plant lovers in the house? Anybody in the house that like hates plants because you kill them? That's okay. You can say woo woo. There is room in heaven for you. It is okay. But I love plants and I love to look at them. I've got, I actually just, I got a few plants. I got... Um, a new plant the other day and it's like lime green. It's gorgeous. I took a picture of it this morning when I was praying. I was like, hallelujah. And I looked over and the sun was shining. I'm like, oh, there is a God. It's beautiful. I love plants. Their growth fascinates me. Like there's something so awesome about how plants grow. Peep this. And you may know this if you're a plant lover. If not, welcome. Okay. If you love a plant, you can actually duplicate that plant. You don't even got to go to Lowe's or the plant store and buy another plant. Guess what you do? You cut it. You cut it and you put it in some water and you watch the roots form. This is bananas. I love it. It's a method called cuttings. I love it. I just did it two times this past weekend. You basically just cut a piece of the stem or the leaf from the parent plant and you just put it in some water and when the roots show themselves. You put it in some soil. It's quite interesting. Um, my husband and I were in Virginia the first week and we were driving and I saw this beautiful, if you've ever been to Virginia, it's just gorgeous. But we saw this uh, little white house and it had a porch and outside the house, it was a store, and outside the house had all these little tchotchke stuff and like little country stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Like apple butter and like soda in fancy glasses and like plants that you've never seen before, but you know they sell them at Lowe's for cheaper, but you'll, you'll pay the $40 because it just looks beautiful. They trick you. But that's where my husband said, babe, you want to go there? Yes, I want to go there. And so it was a magical place. And this store, when I walked up, I could smell plant life, if you know what I'm talking about. I walked in, and it was magical to me. I actually have a picture. It's a, somebody said, oh, my God, hallelujah, we, we receive you, Jesus. This is 
this is just a little spot in the plant store. This is a little white country home. Like it was white outside and it had um, a cute little fence. It was just gorgeous. And this was just in the back area. You can take that slide off. Now, here's the deal. I hear my husband from the other side of the house call my name. He's like, babe, come look at this plant. Absolutely. I run. I'm like, what's up? He's like, do you want this plant? I really think it's cool. I'm like, hmm, yes. I didn't even look at it. I was like, the thing could be ugly. If it's a plant, I just want it. And I actually have a picture of the Listen, hold on. Before, Okay, there it goes. You may not think a lot about this plant, but this is beautiful. And underneath, it's purple. So it's green on the top and purple on the bottom. It was beautiful. And this is a picture I took because I was so excited to show my friend who's a plant person. So that's her. Ain't she cute? My husband also bought me the, the little ring that it's in. Ain't that cute? He was like, we're not going basic. We are going all you, baby. And we got that ring. It's beautiful. I loved it. But here's the deal. I knew it was going to be very tricky to care for this plant because I was going to be gone for almost three weeks and we were on week one. I was selfish. <laughs> I wanted something that I could not care for. So before the plant came home with me, it was in that environment that some of you went, oh, ooh, pretty. It was in an environment that helped it grow. Did you see how lush that place looked? See, the environment that it was in helped it thrive to be the plant that I took home with me that day. The environment had everything that it needed. It had the food, the water. It even had this cute little old lady with a spray bottle. And she was just spraying. That was her job. That is what she lived for. You got librarians and you got plant misters. She was a plant mister. Cute little. She had little Crocs on. Her little skirt. It was beautiful. It was heaven to me. See, the plant wasn't new, but it was healthy because of the environment that it was in. The day I purchased it and took it home with me, I wasn't really thinking, and I just took it. The day I purchased it, it no longer was in the environment it was used to. It traveled with us literally from state to state. And at this point, I don't even know how many states we work through. At one point on the vacation, I hung it outside of a balcony where the balcony was just in the, uh, I was on the fourth floor, but the balcony wasn't outside. It was actually inside. I don't even know what. And on the outside of this balcony, the AC was tripping and it was no longer AC, it was heat. And I didn't know this, but I hung my plant out where the heater was. Fast forward to last week when I landed back in Florida and I pulled my plant out from the back of my trunk and it looked like this. She, she's not cute anymore. Take it off, please. <laughs> You see, the new environment it was in lacked the resources it needed to thrive. Stay with me, okay? You with me? It wasn't that I didn't want to care for it. I couldn't in the environment that I put it in. That plant wasn't meant to be in the back of a trunk for 16 hours while I traveled. It wasn't meant to hang on a hotel balcony drinking hotel sink water. I started to think about my plant on my way back. This is, these were the things that I was thinking. I was sleep deprived, hungry with two kids in the back. My car was full to the brim because I wasn't the only plant that I bought. <laughs> I was tired, but I was listening to some worship music and I started thinking about my plant. I'm like, oh man, this, how, I'm really upset at the fact that this plant seems like it's not going to make it. And in typical preacher style, I started thinking about a sermon. <laughs> and I started to think about lives, thinking about our lives in Christ. And how some of us are in environments that are causing us to deteriorate slowly. 
We are in spaces that we were never meant to be or created to thrive in. And so we struggle because the resources aren't there for us to thrive. So today's sermon is called Plant Life. It's not a sermon series. Today, you're going to hear about it and it will be gone tomorrow. Never to be seen again, unless you want to go to our YouTube channel, Authentic Church, My Authentic Church. You can listen to it. Share it with your friends. But today's sermon is called Plant Life. What does it look like for us to grow as followers of Christ? Because I know if you are a decent human being, you do not want to stay the same. What does it look like to thrive and not wither away? When I think about this, I cannot help but be reminded of the story of the prodigal son. The story of the prodigal son is one of the most well-known parables of Jesus. And you can find it in the Gospel Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. And so if you are taking notes this morning, I encourage you to write this down. Because here's the deal, I'm not going to be able to um, read all 21 verses. So read it on your own time. Now, Jesus frequently used parables in his teachings to convey complex truths in a way that was accessible and memorable for those that were listening. And so the prodigal son is one of them. And I'm going to quickly paraphrase it so we can continue to move on. But I want you to get the word in you this morning. Amen? Maybe you've heard this story before. Maybe you haven't. But Jesus tells a story about a man who had two sons. And the younger son asked his father for his share of the inheritance. Okay. The father agreed. The son wasn't really happy. He wanted to leave. And so he's asking, hey, give me me my money. Give me what you owe me. So the father agreed. And guess what? The son leaves home. He leaves. He picks up and just goes. And he spends all his money on wild living in a distant land. And soon, he was left with nothing. And a severe famine hit the country. And so he became desperate. And he found a job feeding pigs. Now, he was in his father's home where he had all the resources and he was cared for. And now we find him trying to find a job feeding pigs. And at one point, he was so hungry because we need to eat, right? At one point, he was so hungry. Scripture tells us that even the pig's food looked good. You ever been so hungry you just eat anything? Like, just give me anything edible at this point. So he realizes that he made a mistake leaving the environment that he was in, leaving his father's home. And he decides to return home and ask his father to to take him back in. and, and, And he asks for forgiveness. And he says this, that he was no longer worthy to be called his son, but he hoped to be treated as a servant. He was so desperate that he... He just wanted to be back in that environment that he knew and that he was cared for. That he would be willing to just serve. He knew that the environment he was originally in was good. And he wanted to go back. Now while he was still a long way off, the son, his father sees him, runs to him and embraces him. The son began to apologize, but the father interrupted, calling for a celebration because his son, who was lost, had been found. Ain't that precious? That story really is about God and us, that parable. And it teaches us about forgiveness, teaches, about, teaches us about repentance, and the boundless love of God. But it also highlights something. You ready? It also highlights the effects of being in the wrong environment. He was in an environment where he was cared for. He had resources at his fingertips. He had food. He had clothes. He had a nice home. He had a father who loved him. 
He was in a safe space, but because he desired to be outside, he desired to be, to, to test out other things because what he had wasn't enough. It didn't satisfy his flesh and his flesh wanted something. And so he took what was safe and the resources that he had at his fingertips and he traded it out for the streets. He chose to indulge in the things of the world that left him without money and resources to survive. He literally partied everything away. He looked like a plant in the trunk. Dried up and withering away. Under his father's care, he would have thrived. Outside of his care, he found himself thirsty, hungry, and looking for someone to help. Just like my plant, he began to wither away because he was, he was in the wrong environment. The sun began to wither away because he chose to step outside of the covering that was meant for him. Usually when you buy a plant, you take it home or you know some buy it for their office and you care for it with the resources that you have you usually don't buy a plant and then chuck it out the window you take it home and you're like let's try this thing out I took the plant from a space where it had resources and moved it from the hotel room to the trunk it was in the wrong place and it was not thriving so here's the deal. There are a couple of things we can learn about environments. If you're taking notes, let's go. If you are feeling uncomfortable in the environment you are in, it doesn't necessarily mean to run. Too many of us prematurely leave a place because it wasn't our vibe. And I'm not talking about being unsafe in your environment. That is, those are two different things. Being unsafe in your environment, that, run, don't even, don't even get your shoes. Run. This is not what I'm talking about. See, feelings, feeling challenged and uncomfortable in your environment doesn't mean you should run from it. In a good environment, Challenges help you grow, even if it feels uncomfortable. When I first got married, I've been married 23 years, okay? Over two decades. When I first got married, I didn't understand the power of staying planted. I was uh, historically a runner in my life. Like, I don't like you, peace, I'm out. So I didn't understand the power of staying planted. And I thought feeling uncomfortable in my marriage meant I, it was the end. When we would get into a really bad disagreement because of whatever the case may be. And I felt uncomfortable or I felt justified in the way I spoke to him. But because he made me uncomfortable in that moment. Well, you know what? You're not my vibe and I need to run. But here's the deal. I didn't realize until years later, the reality was that that challenge that was happening in marriage, that discomfort, not unsafety, that's not what I'm saying, but that discomfort, that challenging, that stretching, that, man, this feels a little uncomfortable, was actually helping me grow in areas that I did not allow God to touch. And so because God loves me so much, the environment I was in was safe. It was under God. But my flesh was like, I don't, I don't feel good about this. You're not making me feel good. My feelings are hurt. Let me tell you something. When it comes to your feelings and your soul, I would go with your soul. I would not go with your feelings. Because your feelings will feel one way this week and next month, I promise you, it'll change. It's the nature of the beast. Another thing about environments is this. We are meant to be in environments where Christ is present. Anything apart from him won't help you grow, but will slowly destroy us, you. 
And we see that with the prodigal son. He was under the care of his father and then he wasn't. That last part, slowly destroy you. The thing about being in a slow pattern of destruction is that you don't see the catastrophic effects of it until you look back and most of your peace of mind is gone. Your integrity has been compromised. Your relationships are actually more toxic than healthy. Your speech is full of deceptions. You believe lies more than you believe the truth. Or the cycle of addiction never gets broken. You just wither away and die. So how can we as followers of Christ grow and thrive in our relationships? In our relationships with him. First, we need to be in environments where he is present. Don't try to come out. Do not be a prodigal son where he was under the care of his father. And once he stepped out, he thought the streets was better. I talk to people all the time that feel lonely and angry and nothing seems to be going right for them. I mean, that's what I do. I'm in ministry, so I hear the worst of things in people. And I ask them, I usually ask them, well, what kind of environment are you in right now? What feeds you daily? What's your water intake? What's your, what are you eating? What kind of people do you surround yourself with? See, the right environment is crucial to grow. The right environment was crucial for my plant to grow. And because I took it out, it started to wither away and die. But the right environment is with Christ. The right environment helps you see yourself as God sees you, not how your feelings tell you that night. So if you're taking notes, one, number one, how can we grow and thrive? Be in an environment that challenges you, not one that enables you. Be in an environment that challenges you, not one that enables you. Proverbs 27, 17 says this. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. We are called to sharpen each other, not enable each other. Be in an environment that causes you to stretch and step outside of your flesh, not one that accepts your mess and then leaves you to rot in it. You ever been in spaces like that? You been in, ever been in friendship circles that, that they see your mess, they never call you out and they just let you rot in it? They're not for you. They want you to fail. Be in environments that call you out when you're acting like a prodigal son. Be in environments when you are about to make the wrong choice that will mess up the call that God has on you, that you have a crew behind you say, I'd rather lose you as a friend than lose your soul. Be in environments that call you out when you are acting like a prodigal son. Now be careful that the people that are calling you out don't make a game out of calling you out. Because in actuality, they have more of the issue than you do. So you probably need to remove yourself from that environment. We are called to love each other, not enable each other. Here's what enabling looks like. It looks like supporting or allowing behaviors that are harmful to our relationships and our relationship with Christ. So if you're being challenged or feeling uncomfortable and it's because the environment you are in isn't allowing you to live in the flesh, it calls you out for your foolishness. My friends, you are in the right space. I've been in ministry for over two decades and I'm not lying to you when I tell you that I have sat in front of people that have told me they don't like my leadership. Rude. I am pretty great. Get to know me for the love of God. I like plants, books, cafecito, and walks. Like, I'm very simple. But I've had people tell me, I just don't like how you lead. Okay, está bien, fine. Or I don't like the church, and I'm leaving. All because if you know me, I don't let anyone stay a fool. 
I will challenge. And I rather you not like my leadership and you'll get over it than you walk yourself right into the pits of hell. Because at the end of my life, I want to say, I didn't need friends. I just wanted the kingdom to grow. Be in circles that challenge our foolishness. Two, how can we grow and thrive? Stay connected to the vine. I love how the scripture talks about planting. It's meant to be. Stay connected to the vine. What does this mean? If you've never read the scripture before, you can find it in John 15. And I'm going to read the five verses here. It says, I am the true vine. This is Jesus. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Amen. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me. This is Jesus. Remain in Jesus as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Stay connected to the vine, to Jesus. Jesus identifies himself as the true Vine, And you know what this means? This means that he is the source of spiritual life and nourishment. Staying connected to the vine involves maintaining a close and active relationship with Jesus. He's not a friends with benefits kind of a relationship. Where we connect on the weekend when I want something. See, Jesus doesn't deserve that. He doesn't deserve to be used and abused. So let's look at the word active. Active. Being active means regularly engaging in spiritual practices. Such as prayer. Worship. Bible reading. Serving. Friends, we can struggle because we want to hear God's voice, but we don't want to read what he already said to us in his word. So we struggle. Or we go to all the people that have the degrees, that have already read the scriptures over and over again. The great thing about God is that we can read about him ourselves and then ask a community of believers to help us process what we just read. We can be consistently confused on what his will is because we aren't familiar with what he is already known for. We struggle to trust God because we do not know him very well because we barely pray. There's a research group, a Barna group, 2017 said this. About 50% of practicing Christians, this is some time ago, 50% of practicing Christians, those who attend church regularly and consider faith important, pray daily. So 50%. And so that, for some, is like, wow, that's so great. What? I read it like this. This means that 50% of Christians do not pray regularly. We want God to move mountains, but we won't move away from the phone or the TV. We want God to to work on our behalf, but we're always putting our hands in it. When he's saying, "I, I actually want to move on your behalf, but you're too nosy. Get your hands off of me and watch me do a miracle that you think you can do, but only I can do. We want to hear God, but don't make room for him to speak because we're too busy telling him how our lives should be. 
We're too busy being infatuated with our own opinions. That we don't make room for God to speak. We wither away and die when we disconnect from the vine, Jesus. If you find yourself disconnected from Christ at the end of this service, we're going to pray. Because we're going to return. We're going to return back to the vine. Amen? And for those believers that are in this room, that should excite you. That should excite you that there are potential people in this room that are not connected to the vine. And they're going to have an opportunity at the end to reconnect. Hallelujah. We may need to ask, all of us in this room, we may need to ask for forgiveness, for making excuses for our disconnection. Because we cannot use the excuse that other people made me disconnect from Jesus. Because in the end, that will not reconnect you. But owning your junk and giving it to the Lord does. We find nourishment for our souls when we are connected to the vine. Number three, how can we grow and thrive? Do not outsource your relationship care. Stay with me. We should not delegate or transfer the responsibility of maintaining and nurturing our relationship with Christ to someone else. In other words, you need to personally invest in and actively manage your relationship with Jesus rather than relying on someone else to handle it for you. When I was in youth ministry years ago, we had a testimony service. It was a fairly big church and there was a testimony service happening and it's where you come up and you just tell the congregation all the things that God had been doing in that season of life. And there was a young lady who was on stage and she was just, she gave her life to the Lord and she was radically changed. But during her testimony, she said, I really want to give a shout out to my mentor, Stacy. She said, thank you for walking with me. I couldn't have done this without you. And I was like, "Ah, Jesus, you know. And so I walk outside and a father from our youth ministry pulls me aside, actually pulls me by my arm and says, hey, I know you're really good with teens. I need you to fix mine. What he really needed was not for me to fix his daughter. What he really needed was to step up and be the dad I know his daughter told me she was begging for. But he tried to outsource what he was responsible for. He tried to outsource fatherhood to someone else. We cannot, we cannot outsource our relationship care. It is our responsibility. Philippians 2, 12 and 13 says this, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Don't outsource it outsource it you continue for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose see this passage is telling us the importance of actively working on our relationship with Jesus acknowledging that while God is at work in us we also have a role in pursuing and nurturing our faith It is not saying that we have a personal responsibility. It says that we have a personal responsibility to manage our stuff, manage our conduct. It is on us. No one can make you stop cheating. No one can make you stop lying. No one can make you stop indulging in things that cause you harm. This is between you and God, me, and your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ can walk out life with you, but we can't do it for you. And I know from experience in my own life that the enemy likes to plant things in our minds 
And one of the lies that we believe is this. Well, they hurt me. But here's a deal with those three words, they hurt me. It has an expiration date. Because at some point in our life, in our journey, we will have to take responsibility for the way we are responding now. And if I can press pause and go to the fixers in the room, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But to the fixers in the room, stop trying to fix everyone around you and let God be God. Because fixers make environments very hard for others to thrive in. Get your hands off of people. Let God be God and watch them thrive. And lastly, keep your word to God. Deuteronomy 23, 21 through 23 says this, if you make a vow to the Lord your God, do not be slow to pay it. For the Lord your God will certainly demand it of you and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from making a vow, you will not be guilty. Whatever your lips utter, you must be sure to do because you made your vow freely to the Lord your God with your own mouth. When you tell God you are going to do something, guess what? Do it. Because keeping our word to God is an act of worship. Keeping our word to God is an act of worship. So when you commit to marriage, you better be sure to love your spouse the way he told you to love them. When you tell God that you promise to stop the thing that causes you to separate yourself from him, then you better be sure to get help from the people that he's placed in your life. See, God is a God of resources. So there's an entire community that God has for you. When you tell God that you promise to be honest, your words better be filled with nothing less than that. And friends, your environment should be occupied with people who hold you accountable for the things you say, not indulge in your deception. You may be thinking, okay, sis, it's real easy to say that. You may be thinking it's not that easy, and it's not. But I said just a few minutes earlier that God is a God of unlimited resources. So when you tell him you're going to walk in the way of righteousness, he will supply you with the right people and things to help you walk it out. And guess what he left for us? He left his Holy Spirit. So when we think we cannot do anything, remember, we cannot separate from him. But because through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can make a vow to God and we can keep it. It's not about perfecting the vow. It's about the heart posture of making that vow. I have my plant that was in the trunk. I have it here today. If you can bring it out. If you could just hold it there for a little bit. Thank you, Bronte. <clears throat> it's in recovery now. Honestly, I'm not joking. It's it's in recovery mode right now. I'm very hopeful that it will be it will come back to the original state of where it was thriving. Because I have all the resources now. I have the perfect spot in my window. I have the food, I have the water, and I've got a mister. Got two of them. Here's the deal, the same goes with us. Some of us may have removed ourselves out of the environment God created for us. Maybe it was by our own choices. Or we in the right environment, but we're muddying it up with our toxic patterns and then blaming everyone else. Causing the environment to feel stale. What's not your environment, it's our behavior. It's not the environment, but it's us. Let's go further. Maybe someone ripped you out of the environment that you were supposed to be in and you have no control over it because God is a God 
that is good and he is a God of second chances, we are able to replant ourselves in a new environment and grow and thrive or become aware of our toxicity and restore the environment that God originally created us to be in. It's going to take some time for my plant to come back to life. It's already starting to look better. You may think it, no. But I, I promise, it's already, I took out all the dead parts. I started plucking all the dead parts. And I started packing it together. And I was misting it. And I put it in several different spaces where I knew the sun was going to come and shine over it. And so it is no longer in the environment it used to be because someone forcefully took it out and placed it in the back of a trunk. But now I am choosing to hang it in the right environment and give it the resources it needs to thrive. That is the God that we serve. That we, even though we miss this environment or we mess this environment up, God says, oh, I'm a God that can replant. I am a God that comes along your life and mists those areas that are drying up. But you must stay connected to God. Plant yourself. Plant yourself. I'm taking that home today. I'm already in a panic that has been out in the dark back there. I'm fully aware. But I'm going to take it home today. I'm going to take it out of my car immediately and I'm going to place it back to where it's going to thrive. And if you've been to my house, I have this massive window in my dining room. And I put a little chain loop thingy there and that's where it's hanging. I don't even know if it looks good. But I am determined that this thing comes back to life. The God we serve is determined to get you to the place you need to be in order for you to thrive. So if you can stand up, if you're physically able, we're going to end this service. And we're going to pray and I'm going to... I'm going to invite you up. We tend to skip altar, but I'm going to open this up. And I'm, I'm, if, if you respond to this altar, I have people here that are going to pray with you. I need you to come up here and, and pray. Okay? I don't know what environment you're in. That's not my business. That's between you and God. What is my business is me telling you the, the truth of what it looks like when you remove yourself out of the environment God created you to be in. We wither away and die. If you want to know what your environment should look like, I highly suggest start reading your Bible. Start praying. Start talking to your fellows and fellow brothers and sisters that attend your church and say, can I ask you a question about this? God says this in the word. Is, that a, is he talking to me? Invite people into your environment to care for you. Because here's the deal. That plant doesn't have arms and legs. It has someone that cares for it enough to go around and water it and feed it and do the thing. There are people in this room that want to walk with you with a spray bottle and, and mist you. I promise. I have been in spaces, and not all spaces were the great. Were great, I get it. But my goodness, we're dealing with imperfect people. We deal with the same nonsense, and yet we hold each other at this expectation that can never be met. Man, what if we just looked at each other as, man, just brothers and sisters that at one point were broken sinners, and because God is good, He's restored us. And just walk this out with me. So before we end in prayer, I do want to give this invitation. If you're in this room and you, <clears throat> and you want to be connected to the vine, 
do me a favor. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes just out of respect for other people next to us. This is not a circus show. This is a moment of intimacy with the Lord. Father, open ears, spiritual ears right now, Father. If you are in this room and you want to be connected to the vine, will you raise your hand, please? Okay, you can lower your hand. Prayer people, can you come up, please, for me to be prepared? Eliz, too, please. So when we end this prayer, I want you to walk up and I want you to have your brother or sister pray for you. Because remember, we right now are carrying the water bottle to mist you. So let us do that for you. Amen. And then the second part of this invitation is if you need your environment restored. You don't necessarily have to run away from it, but you just need your environment restored. And I'm not saying that other people would change, but that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you would change. You would have a different perspective. You would see God working out things for your good. So that's the second group of people. I'm going to invite you up here to pray. But let me pray over you. Father, I thank you because you are a God that really does care about all the important things, all the little things in our life. You care about the things that are in our heart. You care about the things that get us upset. You care about the things that make us uncomfortable. You care about the things that make us feel some type of way. You care about all these things. And because you are a good God, you don't want us to live in our muddy mess. So, Father, thank you. Thank you that you are good. Thank you. All across this room, can we just raise our hands and say, thank you, God. Because we can't receive the word, let it fill us, and then not worship the God that is making mountain mountains move in your life so all across this room can we just raise our hands and say thank you can you verbally out loud say thank you God let this be a place of worship God that this place is not going to be a place where we just receive and and get from you but we now give you worship father in the name of Jesus some of you need to give your environment up because the environment that you're in is making you deteriorate wither wither away and you are dying so father give them the strength to walk away from the environment that they are in and go towards the environment that you are in if there are spaces where our integrity is compromised help us to seek you God Help us to seek you. If we've made a vow, a commitment to you, I pray that today would be the day for many that they will fulfill that promise to you. Because let me tell you something, you have fulfilled your promise to us. And so we thank you, God. We thank you, God. As we're praying with your head bowed, and your hands still up in worship. We're not done. We're two more minutes. If you answered either one of those invitations, can you make yourself, uh, can you come forward, please? I want to pray for you, and my friends want to pray for you. You don't have to be shy. Father, I thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to make this space, this altar, a place where we worship God. We're going to make this a a space where we acknowledge our weaknesses. We are going to make this a, a space where we acknowledge that we are nothing separate from God. Thank you, Jesus. Just one more minute. Just worship God. 
I know we're on a schedule. I know that you got to pick your kids up in like 35 seconds. But here's the deal. It's okay to just shake things up a little bit. Some of us, and this is not me shaming you. This is the reality of life because I have been there for many times. Some of us, our only time with the Lord was on a Sunday morning. And so I encourage you, don't run away from this moment. Don't run away from this moment. Be in this moment. Thank the Lord. Just one more minute. And feel free to come up whenever you want. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray a covering over those at Authentic Church right now, God. From every person sitting in this space, from the front all the way to the back, in the name of Jesus, I pray a protection over them. I pray that no weapon formed against their minds that tell them to run, that those weapons will not prosper. I pray that a protection over them, a covering that will help settle their chaotic mind when, when their minds are running amok. May you be the peace that hovers over them. I pray for families in this room, friends, husbands, wives, singles, those in between, whoever you are in whatever season you're in, stay planted, don't run, stay connected to the vine. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The altar is still active right now, so you can come and ask for prayer if you want. If not, I'll see you next week. Pastor Kev is going to preach a one-off. God bless you.